All right. Welcome to Comp 397 in the winter 2018 semester at Centennial. And we are week one, part one of our broadcast. We're really talking about course intro and the term project. First thing, if you haven't had a chance to do it already, is please sign up for our Slack channel at Comp 397. And this is wrong, but go anyway, and go get there anyway. W2017.slack.com. So find that. Notice there's 28 users right now. I want each of you to connect to that because this is where I'm going to be sharing um, important links, some files, and some additional information. There are going to be three different channels that are going to be set up by default. One of them is going to be the general channel, right? The general channel I'll be using for announcements. So please don't put any cat videos or any kind of cute things there, random stuff. That you put into random. Under random, this is where you can put your cat videos and interesting topics of the day. You know, Trump, you know, putting the uh, doomsday clock forward until two minutes to midnight, blah, blah, blah. Put all that stuff in here if you care. Developer will be used for any kind of questions relating to, you know, kind of uh, development, uh, game development, including coding, other design things, whatever you want. And you can make your own channels in here for your team if you wish. So this is just a separator for all the communications we're going to do. I've already put on, if you log in, and if you connect to um, comp397-w2017.slack.com as your Slack channel, and again, it's available to anyone with a my.centennialcollege.ca email address, right? Then you should see a bunch of stuff that I've posted earlier today. Okay, so one of them is this no, this uh, link to Visual Studio Code. And we're going to get to that. I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code for the majority of the semester. I won't be using um, Visual Studio. Some people may choose to use Visual Studio. I won't be using it. And I'm not going to be using Atom or some of the other uh, edit text editors out there. I'm just using Visual Studio Code. So there's a link to that. So please download and install it if you don't have it already. For this class, I highly recommend, just like Eddie said, you bring your own laptop if you have it. If you don't have a laptop, it's okay. You can survive on the machine in front of you. But there'll be much more control with a laptop if you have it on your, if you have one for yourself, right? So I highly recommend it. Mac or PC does not matter in this case. You can use either one to develop web games. And actually, web, and web uh, games on Mac is much easier from the get-go than PC because PC requires more installation items. Once you get going, however, it's equivalent. Once you have the setup ready to go, um, whether it's PC or Mac, you're good to go. I'm also going to be sharing all my code on github.com. And if you don't have anyone not have a GitHub account, if you don't have a GitHub account, please go to github.com and set one up. Sign up for GitHub. We're going to be using GitHub extensively in this course, right? So please sign up for it. This is where I'm going to be sharing all of my files. Uh, the stuff that I'll be talking about in class. Sometimes I run, just like Eddie said, a little quicker than normal, right? Okay, a lot quicker than normal. So because of that, it's good to see my files up on GitHub, right? So that you're not left out. You're not going to sit there and go like, okay, Tom, I couldn't do this thing. Can you stop the class and show me how to do it? I may not have the time every time, right? This class is that example. I can't, I may not be able to stop, okay? So github.com is where I'm sharing everything. I'm also going to be using the CreateJS library for this class. So it's a library of, or a suite of files. Um, there's EaselJS, PreloadJS, SoundJS, and TweenJS, different suites. And I'll be tapping into at least two of them this semester, probably three. I'll probably be using EaselJS, SoundJS, and PreloadJS. Tween, I may get to, I may not, right? But those are the ones that I will be using from the library. I could have chosen other um, frameworks. For example, there is a great framework uh, that you may want to check out called Phaser, phaser.io. It produces great games as well. And I'm not against using it in a real world scenario. Disadvantage, you it's a framework. It's not a suite of libraries that are loosely coupled. This means that if you have to make changes, you have to know the framework really well. Most of you won't by the end of the semester. It's too much to learn. Right, so it's hard. Um, it's a little harder to pick up, and even if you get started fast, modifying what you create can be more difficult once you've created it. For example, you can make a platformer with Phaser really quickly, but then modifying the platformer and customizing it for your own purposes very hard. Right, so that's why I've chosen to use EaselJS, and it's also a little lower level, which gives you a little bit more control 
and opportunities to learn uh, than um, Phaser. All right, so that's the tools that we're going to be using. There's also um, TypeScript, and typescriptlang.org is where you go. So if you go to typescriptlang.org with me for a second, I'm going to go to TypeScript here. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. We're going to largely do everything in JavaScript, right? Very little HTML in this course and very little CSS. It's not an HTML and CSS games kind of course. It's a JavaScript games course, which means all of you, the expectation is that all of you will be coding in this course. If you're not great at coding, then you'll be challenged throughout the entire course. You're going to have to learn how to code very well, right? Now, most of you have taken um, uh, programming one and at this point programming two. And you've probably taken Comp229, which is Java programming as well, right? So you might have enough programming background to make it a little easier for you to pick up some of the um, topics and concepts in this course without having me, me having to go through them from scratch again. So that's TypeScript. We're going to be using TypeScript. Again, please sign up for Slack if you haven't had a chance to already. I got 34 signups. I think there's 40 students. There's also the GitHub education pack, which I recommend that you get, education.github.com forward slash pack. And what this does is it gives you, GitHub gives you a bunch of public repositories. But if you want to create private repositories, like you and your team, then you can actually, if you sign up for this student pack, it comes with unlimited private repositories that you can use. And you can share those repositories with me if I want to evaluate them. Like I said, education.github.com. All right, I'm going to start looking at the final project overview. I, Eddie talked about it briefly as this course is a project-based course. Um, I, people have expressed concern in the past, for example, last year, uh, last semester, where they said, hey, Tom, I didn't expect it to be a project-based course. I thought it was just a course with a bunch of assignments. Um, yeah, it was like that at one point. And if you look back at the videos, I think four or five assignments that I used to have in this course, plus the, the, the project. Right. And the project usually came around week 10. So you had like four weeks to create a small project, which was a game. And the uh, quality of the project was fairly low. Right. Now you learn the basis of um, of CreateJS and TypeScript and so on. But you didn't get along. You didn't get too far with the actual project itself. Nowadays, most things is, pro is you know, we use project based learning for most of the things. And so we've converted this course with the help of Wallace. Um, he's another professor in the interactive gaming program uh, to kind of use uh, project-based learning as opposed to assignment-based learning. So what is project-based learning? Well, what you're gonna do is you and your team are gonna create a, an original, and I say original with quotations, you know, like kind of hanging quotations in the air, air quotes, original 2D game, and you will work with a team of your peers to design, develop, test, and demonstrate your project along with the information um learn throughout the process your group will be responsible for providing um documentation reviews of work throughout the process each member of the group will be assigned a development role that they are responsible for during the course development okay what does this mean well for people who had me last semester and there's a few of you then um some people from first first uh uh first section it's very similar to what we did with comp 305 so uh, last semester, I taught Comp 305, Game Programming 1, and Comp 397, uh, Web Game Programming. Both those courses are now using project-based learning, so we use a similar system. However, I've revised it based on the learnings we had from last semester. So you're going to develop your game with a, within a team uh, structure, but we found that it's easier for you to give yourself a prime ship, almost like a main role, aside from being a developer. So you're a developer. All of you are developers. But maybe someone has to take the reins when it comes to software engineering. So when it comes to making a decision for software engineering, there's the software engineer. And what he does or she does is they're responsible for the final decisions when it comes to scripting and scene generation, uh, coding style, all that kind of stuff is a software engineer. The producer slash project manager, and this is one of the challenging, most challenging roles, they don't have a lot of power, right? Because they're all students like you. So imagine if I have to tell someone, say I have to tell Eddie, Eddie, you got to do this thing. Eddie might say, I'm sorry, I'm busy, right? He may not do it for me, right? Or I say, Raphael, I tell Raphael, I say, hey, maybe you can do something for me. And Raphael says, I'm busy, right? It might be the case that the project manager isn't listened to. So it's the most challenging role. It's a communication role. It's an organizational role. 
It's a role where you document and plan, right? Along with development, okay? So for someone who wants to be this, this has to be inside of you. You wanna organize, you wanna plan stuff in addition to other things. Then there's the artist sound engineer. Now, for the most part, most of you are not interactive gaming students. How many interactive gaming students do I have in the, cl in the class right now? I have what, uh, one, two, three, four, I have more in the second half, maybe five. Thank you. Uh, more in the second half than I do in the first half, uh, first half being the first section, right? So most of you who are not game students, I mean, you've never done art, maybe, or you haven't done sound. It's okay. There's going to be some sites that I'm going to give you that you can go up and, and basically download stuff from the internet to use. We're not going to make a game to sell in this course. We're making a game uh, for, as a prototype for you to practice and create your own portfolio. That's what this thing is all about. So game designer is another role, and this is where the game designer creates the rules for the game, and they may have the vision for the game. A visionary, if you are the kind of person that wants to get your game made this semester, be the game designer. If you don't care about what game you make and you're not a game player, if you don't play games, don't be the game designer, because that would be like trouble. You never, I never played games before, but I want to design. I'm, I'm sorry, how do you know how to make games if you've never played games? And I mean, playing games as easy as Monopoly or any board game or, or video game you can play, mostly of, of, of course video games. But if you have some ex experience playing with the rules, then game designer, if you've ever thought, hey, I'm gonna make my own game, game designer might be for you. A QA tester, a lot of times, you know, we have a chance to, to uh, create our game. And just like Eddie said, we have to, you know, kind of decide if we're gonna hack or we're gonna make perfect code. I'll tell you right now, guys and girls, there's no perfect code. It's not gonna happen. You're gonna have bugs. You're gonna to wanna to test your code and you need somebody to go and play test your game, see if it's fun, right? And check it out. And someone who's primarily um, involved with gameplay programming. So someone who's a gameplay programmer, that would be your QA tester, who's involved with things like movement and how things work and dyna the dynamics of the game. That's something that you wanna uh, have your QA tester do for you. So, so different roles, but all of you are gonna be required to know everything about the game. The game isn't something you're gonna say, well, I'm a, I'm a producer, so I know nothing about the game. Now, some of you, some of that happened last semester. Some of some, last semester, people didn't know how to program and they got away with it because last semester was weird. We had a strike, we had a bunch of other things happening. So this semester though, there's more time. Um, one thing to note is this semester is 13 weeks. Our course is gonna be 12 weeks. Okay, why is that? Because, you know, some courses, if you're on a Monday, you might have a, a you know, a family day, you're gonna lose a day, a family day, you might lose a day if you're on Fridays with Easter. For us, you're gonna lose the last day because it's, we officially stop on the 27th. So the 28th of April is, there's no class. So the last class in this course is the 21st of April. And that's why I have 12 weeks here and not 13 for this semester. What this means is we have actually a, more of a tight timeline in terms of production. It doesn't mean that we're not, it's not doable. It means that some of the things that I could have done with a couple more weeks, like for example, a lessons learned document, another revision of your game design document and so on, I can't do this semester. I have to give that up. So if you notice my project is worth 80%, right? I have my team contract, which you're gonna do, you're gonna do today. And it's gonna be due by next week, week two, right? Your game pitch the following week, what's my game about? We're gonna talk about that in a bit. Part three is gonna be your first playable build. It's gonna, you're gonna have some stand uh, stand in graphics, placeholder graphics, if you will. And you're gonna have your main mechanic showing, maybe a first level, no start screen, no end screen, just your game running is required, right? By week five. And that's worth 15% of your grade. It's also gonna include a presentation. You're gonna present this alpha build. Every time you, you do an, a build, you're gonna present it. There might be a time when, for example, the beta build we may not present because of time, but there's two presentations for sure. One of them is the first playable, and for sure, one of them is uh, your um, final release and final presentation, okay? Notice there's a mid-semester break, and that's gonna hit us between week six and seven, if I'm not wrong, right? That happens officially the sixth week of class during February 26th to March 2nd. We won't have any class during that time, March 3rd, we won't have class. And then we're gonna get back, and when we come back from break, we'll have a midterm test right after our alpha. So we'll have our alpha presentation on week seven. That's gonna be where you, your alpha is gonna include more graphics, more sounds, collisions, and you're gonna have a beginning screen, the play scene and the end screen, right? Uh, and that's what you're gonna have, just three scenes, right? 
but it's not going to be finished. It's going to be a good example of what your game can be, but it's not your final game. Then you'll have your midterm test, which in this semester will be individual. Okay, why? Well, we haven't this all everything that you normally do is group. It's group work for everything, right? But you still need to know CreateJS and you need to, you need to prove. And when I evaluate you in your midterm, you have to prove that you understand CreateJS, TypeScript, the environment, you know how to set up a project, all those kind of things. So please don't skate on somebody else's coattails this semester and say, I'm a producer. I don't need to know code. Everyone needs to know everything. Okay. It's still a development course. It's a programming course. It's not a project course. We're using project-based learning, but it's not a project course. So midterm test happens at week eight. This is two weeks after we get back from break, right? And then your beta is going to be up and your beta is going to be your first, uh, your mate, your start screen, first two levels. And I recommend a tutorial level and your end screen. And then finally on part six, you're going to have your final release where you have your start screen, three levels, maybe a boss, a boss level and your end screen. Now notice that there is lots of time. It looks like from now until then. There's no time. There's no time to do this stuff. The stuff that we're talking about doing requires, like Eddie said, consistency, um, you know, diligence, and working well with your team. If you're not a team player, this may not be the course for you. You know, if you can't play with play well with others, um, there is no possibility for you to do your project on your own. I will not accept that this semester. You have to do it with other people, and in the real world, we work with others. Okay, one thing to note is if you actually add all these marks up, it works out to ninety-five percent. But what about the other 5%? But well, we're going to be doing something called peer evaluations or peer reviews. So every time you produce stuff, starting at week five, so when you do your first playable build, you're going to do a peer evaluation. You're going to kind of evaluate your team. And you're going to say, you know what, Eddie, he did a great job, right? Out of a scale of one to five, he was a five. Ashley, yeah, you know what? She wasn't, she didn't attend meetings. Sorry, Ash, I'm just using your name. And, uh, you know, we're going to give her a four. Raphael? He wasn't, he, you know, he disappeared throughout the entire semester. I don't know where he is. We're going to give him a zero. Right. And why is that? People might say, well, that's not fair, Tom. Well, hold on a second. This is an early warning indicator for teamwork, right? Imagine you're working with somebody, you made a contract with somebody and they just take off. You never see them all semester. Who's responsible for you're going to do the work for them, especially if you take on a project that requires more people and they're not around, they don't help you. So the peer evaluation system is only worth 1% every time we produce for a total of 5% of your final grade. So there is the little bit of a bump. If you if you actually do well, you participate well, you're gonna get participation marks this way by being in class, by working with your team, by communicating with them, by all that kind of good stuff. If you don't hand in your peer review, you decide not to review anybody, you get zero for that peer, for that peer review, right? So let's say for example, you forgot, there's a peer review and you didn't do it, zero. That means you're not participating in the process. All right, so that's, that's your 100%. That's where all the marks are coming from. Any questions around the project? Now notice, even though the project was 80%, it's broken down into several assignments. They're not like, um, the assignments aren't dependent on the other one. And what I mean by that, even though it says part one, part two, part three, I look at your assignments, your parts, as if I've never seen them before. I'm not gonna base on the previous you know, uh, project parts. Now I will use it for progression. If I see no progression between part one and part two, then we got our part three and part four, I would say, then we got a problem. That means you haven't done any work. If you're, if you're still, if you're supposed to, uh, you know, create an alpha release, but your, your build looks like your first playable build exactly, and you haven't done anything extra, then you're not going to pass. Go ahead. You want to open the door? All right. Um, so any questions around the project? So a project is just, it's just a method. It's a vehicle for us to learn CreateJS, JavaScript, partner with other people, presentations. There's going to be a lot of transferable skills, employability skills for you in this course. Um, this course, even though it's a game course, and even if you're not interactive gaming, you can use the same principles, the same technology that I show you for web projects. Web projects are probably the hardest technology because things change every three months. Um, there's a lot of tools you have to use. Visual Studio Code, Node.js. Uh, TypeScript, uh, Yarn, and a bunch of others that you're going to learn about, GitHub, uh, throughout this course. Whereas if I'm doing things with C Sharp, I need Visual Studio and, and GitHub, and that's it, and I'm good to go, right? So lots of learnings in terms of tooling this semester, right? At the same time, game programming is the hardest programming you can possibly do, because even if you make the game functional, it may not be fun. 
It may suck, right? You might look at your game and go, wow, that's the worst game I've ever seen, right? Almost sounds like a Black Mirror episode. That's like the worst I've ever seen. Um, anyways, but you can see that, um, you know, that um, those two things combined can make this course very challenging. And especially since what Eddie said is true, you have to kind of code on a regular basis. So what kind of games can you make? So you can't just make any game you want because that would be like disaster. I've done this in the past where I said, make whatever game you want, any 2D game, da, 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 da. And then what ends up happening is you get a game that is just does not meet any requirements. It doesn't even look like a game. It looks like some kind of buttons on a screen, right? So we can't have that. So these are the types of games you can do for this course, as well as the people that are involved. So you can do a 2D platformer. I don't recommend this option for anybody who's not a strong programmer. It requires at least four to six people because you need to do game physics, which is another module you have to plug in on your own, right? I'm gonna show you how to do it, but it's another thing you have to plug in to figure out because when you jump, when you're platforming, and you're jumping, it has to look logical. You can make your own physics as well, but it can be quite complex when it comes to the transformations and the math that are required. Elsa, if you can grab it. So that's the 2D platformer. And you notice that it says four to six members two software engineers, one project manager, one game designer, one um, art and sound person, and one QA. Like everyone has a role, and there's two so software engineers. Again, if you have less members, you can, you know, you can kind of go through. One thing I don't want you guys to do is say, I'm a project manager and a game designer. That would be bad. Don't do that. I'm a software engineer and a game designer. That also would be bad. Why is that bad? Imagine, I'm, I've got the vision, and I'm doing the code. Guess what? You guys are following me, and if you don't follow me, see you later. So I'm coding everything. I'm, I'm the guy who's going to, you know, or girl who's going to push, right? The next one is a top-down, side-scrolling, bullet hell shooter, Oof, right? So this is the kind of game that you guys made last semester on Unity, right? But notice it says bullet hell. So I've added that because I want more bullets. I want more bullet types, right? Now, one of the questions I had earlier was, hey, I made this game last semester with Unity. Can I make the same game in JavaScript this semester? For sure. Do it. Why is that? Because it's totally different. It, the only thing that's going to help you is you got the game. You might have the game design document. It might help you from that perspective. You might have all these other things all ready to go. On the downside, all the coding and everything else and trying to get done what you did with Unity is way more difficult. So I'm totally fine with you doing a game you did last semester. No problem. Okay, Just in case you decide to do that. Um, again, it needs two to three members. It's not a very difficult game to make compared to the platformer. One software engineer, one game designer, slash artist, one uh, QA, slash PM. This is okay, because this could be, um, it's not a bad combination. The last game in the kind of game that Eddie made and his, with his team was this top-down tank game slash twin stick shooter. A more challenging game, right? Because if it's top-down, you have two players, right, in the game. I'm, I'm recommending gamepad input. That's an extra thing, right? Uh, multiple tank classes or loadouts, right, for your for your characters. And you saw in Eddie's game how you can choose different characters, right? Distinct terrain with destructible objects, and each level has a goal, right? That's your top-down tank game. Three to four members, again, more challenging than the shooter. I would say a, a level higher. So if I was going to rank these games, the shooter would be easy. This one would be medium. And Eddie's going to get mad at me when I say medium because it wasn't medium for him, right? And the platformer is hard, okay? So easy, medium, hard. And it's hard because of all the things you have to build, the abstractions and all that stuff. It's not hard because of what it is. And you don't have a lot of time. You have the same time to do this as you do the other ones, right? My full expectation is that most of you are going to do a, you know, some kind of side-scrolling bullet hell shooter. And that's fine. Every game must be unique, though. You have to pick your own kind of game. All right, and you can see that there's this went on to the next page for some reason. Uh, bombs and power-ups, uh, I'll have to fix this later on. Let me just do this for now. Um, deliverables, so this week, I'm gonna give you something called a team contract, right? So it's due next week on Saturday. So your team contract is basically a bunch of language around how you and your team are gonna operate, okay? Some people did the team contract very well last, last semester, some people did it very poorly and they didn't adhere to it. And there were some people that had lots of conflicts last semester for different reasons. One of them was the strike. We had a bit of a thing. People left the teams and came back and joined other teams. And that caused some conflict. This semester, I don't, I don't expect that kind of thing. 
But the team contract is there to protect each team member and make sure that everyone does what they're supposed to do. Let's take a look at that now. I put the team contract up on Slack as well. If you look at Slack, there's also this contract template there. So here's the contract template. Contract template actually comes from UIT, right? They do a game development program there. I have to credit them. Um, I've modified it for our use though. So notice it says team name. Okay, please don't leave team name in here. Okay, this is you changing your name to something else. So if you had a previous team name and you wanted to reuse it from last semester and a logo, all the power, you can do that. I'm okay with it. Um, your team contract, right? With members listed and their numbers, I recommend at least an email you should have a student number. And I, I also recommend a phone number if you can, right? Share your phone numbers with each other. So that way they can connect with you. Okay, so don't try and hide. Team expectations. Here's something of what how the language goes. We understand that throughout the course, all team members are designated as developers. Okay, by the end of the semester, we will have function, uh, a functioning and somewhat polished game prototype using the CreateJS suite of JavaScript libraries and TypeScript. So I'm being very specific here. I'm not telling you you can do Java. Don't do a Java game. Don't do a C-sharp game. Don't do an iOS game or something else. It's TypeScript and CreateJS that I want, okay? All team members must be able to communicate decisions, techniques, processes related to all aspects of the development process for the game. Below, we have outlined specific expectations for all team members to adhere to, as well as the consequence for failing to meet each expectation. Meeting times. Team members, team meetings will occur when? Put it down, right? Eddie mentioned one time a week, it might be okay. Some people like to meet the mode remotely through Skype or through um, Google uh, Hangouts or whatever, it's okay. Um, I also find that when I do teamwork with other people, it's always best to meet face to face. I do more uh, physically sometimes. Sometimes it's best to do it remote, especially if I have a small job that I have to do. Uh, for example, recently I built a loader, um, a level editor for uh, Blender. So Blender, imagine using Blender, you put your objects in Blender and then you export with a little Python script that gives you a text file of all the objects in Blender. And then you import that into C++ and it displays all the objects on the stream exactly where you put them. That was my job, right? So that's something that I did and I did it remote. I didn't have to meet with people to have people look over my shoulder to do the work. I could code that myself, right? But sometimes you have to make decisions or you have to take a look at the game or you have to design the document or something and it's best to meet in person. Um, now here's the recourse for failing to meet expectations. How members can fix any problems and remove consequences for failing to meet expectations. If a team member is assigned a task that they are not confident in completing. So for example, I give Ashley a task. I want her to be the programmer, the lead programmer. And she's gonna do the gameplay for the game. And she just doesn't know how to make game, the gamepad work. And if she doesn't speak up and she's accepted that responsibility, it's on her. She accepted the responsibility. And if we find that she, that she hasn't produced, she has to do something to take a corrective action to fix that, right? What can you do if, if, uh, if none of the team members know how to do it? Um, you can ask someone outside the group, ask the professor, ask other interactive gaming students in the class, right? They might know. Um, go up on lynda.com. We have free lynda.com, right? There's other tutorials online where you can learn how to do stuff um, and so on. There's other steps you can take to figure out the problem. Right, and this is just an example of what you can put in here. You can put other, uh, you know, details in here. If a member is unable to complete a task on time or unable to meet the group's quality standards because they needed help, but did not seek it out, so you just said nothing. You disappeared. Right, the group will give them will give them a game development topic to learn about and teach the rest of the group within the next two team meetings. Which means, learn particle systems. You do a particle system. Make make sure you do a particle system editor for two D or something like that. Which means you get more work. If you don't do your work, you're going to get work. That's, just, that's what it means. Once the team member has fulfilled their obligations and either taught the team a new concept or followed up with the instructor and they or they complete the work somehow, then they can reintegrate back into the team as normal. But what happens if you meet, you fail to meet expectations? You just disappear. You become MIA. You're part of a team. No one can get a hold of you. They try and reach out to you. You don't respond. All these negative things. You will potentially be flagged as unproductive. If your flag is unproductive, that particular uh, you know assignment that you're supposed to produce on, you get zero. Okay, I mean somehow if you disappear and you're not available or whatever, you don't communicate with everyone, then it's on you. If you're flagged, 
you know, that means I'm going to know about it, right? And if you break the expectations to the point where you should be flagged, outlining the expectations above, please see your professor with evidence of the issue. Your team member has broken the, the thing, and then the member will be flagged. And then I'll have to follow up with that person. Amendments. Should the team determine an aspect of the contract no longer relevant? Example, uh, Eddie was part of my team, and now he's left, and now he's part of Elsa's team, right? We have to change the contract because you have a new team member, and they've lost one, or I've lost one. So we just have to amend the contract and put them, give them a role, incorporate them in the, in the team, and can make sure they're productive. Okay. Um, and here's the agreement. We, the team of, don't leave it team name. Please make a team name and put it in here. Some people did that last time. Right? Have come up with these expectations together and agreed to adhere to them throughout the academic term. We understand our own rules and the consequences for breaking them. We also agree that we have read and understood the material in the course syllabus or outline. And here's the team names and their signing and everything else. Now, why am I doing this? Is it really binding? It's not really that binding. But at the end of the day, if you signed it, this is proof to me that, you know, you promised this is what you're going to do. And for whatever reason, you didn't, you know, you didn't kind of uh, deliver. Now, there are several things that can happen in a semester. People get sick. People have family problems. People have to do stuff. They have to withdraw. They have to, a bunch of things happen, right? So obviously, you know, there's some flexibility here, but you need to connect with me if someone's not delivering or if they can't be part of your team anymore. That's all I'm saying, okay? The words in the contract are just there to, not to scare anybody, but just to actually create more strength within the team, right? Here's what we agreed to. We're meeting on these days. We're doing this stuff. We're moving, moving together. This person's doing that. You're doing this. I'm doing this. Any questions around team contract? This team contract is due next week, Saturday at midnight for 5% of a frontal grade. That means you have to meet with a team, decide what your team name is, create a logo, right? I want you to create a logo for yourself. If you already have one from last semester, you can use it, right? If you have one from previous semesters, you can use it, right? It's okay. You don't have to make it. I request a logo because it's going to be uh, almost like your stamp that you're going to put on all of your documents, your PowerPoint presentations, your game design documents, even your game. Your logo is going to be that, right? Which is kind of like a signature that tells me this is your game, no one else's. All right. Um, any questions around the team contract? I know it's kind of straightforward, but some people are freaked out by it because it's a contract. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah, well, it, it's necessary when we do projects. Okay, so next week, you're going to be deliver, delivering this team contract. Um, again, you'll create a group of up to six members based on the type of games you'll be developing. You will assign group members to a prime role. Each group member will sign the contract and be accountable for what they've agreed on. We, I talked here about their they don't meet requirements, just like the contract says. Um, I also put in, if conflicts arise, team members may, be, may choose to leave a group and join another group at the discretion of the professor. So let's say, for example, you know what? Eddie doesn't like me. He wants to work with Ashley, right? Because Ashley's awesome as an artist. And you know what? He's feeling a lot of pressure that I've given him a lot of work to do. And I'm not pulling my, my, my uh, stuff. And he just feels conflict for whatever reason, right? He can opt to say, look, I want to join this other team. Would you accept me? And you can swap members in between deliverables. So if I have like a you know, deliver all that's, that's an alpha and you want to switch be between alpha and beta, it's okay. You're just taking a different role for that other team, right? Which means the contract has to be amended and you're moving to them and they, may, they might give up a member to go to the other team. That's okay. It's possible. We can work that out. So what I want is a signed team contract, which is a PDF file next week by midnight, Wednesday, uh, sorry, Saturday. And the team logo, I'd like to see it in PDF format. Let's just convert it to PDF so I can see it, what the team logo is with your name, okay? Any questions around the contract that's due next week on Saturday? Now, one thing that I'm going to do is this section, there's two sections, section one and section two. I'm currently in the process of, of combining sections, so that's why you don't see anything on eCentennial. Eventually, all these documents and everything that I put up on Slack today are going to be up on eCentennial in our combined section, okay? And I'm doing that, so if you want to work with somebody in, in section one, you can do that. If, you want to work, if they want to work with someone, wants to work with someone in your section, they can do that too. If you want to attend the 1230 class instead of the 330 class, you can do that. It's up to you. I want to give you some flexibility. <coughs> All right. Um, I think I've gone for about an hour now. I think it's a great time to take a short break. Um, when we come back, we're going to start doing our setup. So let's take a short break and come back in about 10 minutes.